Okay, so welcome. Hope everyone enjoyed, enjoyed your lunch. Um, so my name is Peter Hessler. Uh, hmm? Okay, how about now? Is that better? Okay. Uh, my name is Peter Hessler. Uh, I am with the OpenBSD project. Uh, and uh, I'll be giving a talk about uh, using BGP as a real-time import and export mechanism for uh, anti-spam lists. Um, so what, what is this? It is a, a network-based spam fighting technique that I created. It takes the bypass and track lists, more commonly known as the whitelist and blacklist, out of the OpenBSD SpamD system. And it uses BGP as a distribution protocol to, to, to spread all of these lists to all of the subscribers who want, who want to get a copy of it. Um, we're using uh, BGP4 and as the as the method, and using BGP communities to apply the tagging of which list it belongs to. Um, so I launched a service for this that I call uh, bgpspamd.net um, at Asia BHCCon in 2013. Um, at the time I started, I only had uh, three upstream sources, and at the end of the conference, I had a total of four users, which was relatively nice for the first launch. Um, as of this morning, I now have five upstream sources and 28 users. And uh, no worries. And uh, it is uh, usable right now. It is, uh, you, if you want to sign up and use it, uh, go to the website. Um, all the configuration and documentation for it exists online. So if you want to run your own service, uh, you can easily do so. Um, if you want to provide me with data for the service, you want to provide either your, your trap list or your white list, please let me know, and uh, we can discuss what's going on. And always, you, more users are welcome. Um, a common question I get is, how can I use this? Uh, you do not have to be, uh, have a registered AS. You do not have to be a, a BGP administrator. You can just simply subscribe to it and add it to your system. Um, I include the specifics of what you have to set up on the website, and this will, uh, and it works works fine through NAT. It works fine over many remote uh, hops and peers, so you don't need to actually be part of the BGP cloud for that. Um, so, a SpamD source system are the the five upstream servers that I mentioned. Uh, they only list the specific IP address of what. Of, uh, that, that they've seen behavior from. Um, intentionally, and different from many other anti-spam techniques, is we will not and do not penalize any network neighbors. Just because you live in a, in a dangerous neighborhood doesn't mean you should be shot too. <laughs> um, it's a very simplistic method. Uh, we only want to, to catch the, the low-hanging fruit. We want to get to the obvious spammers and uh, we also need to be careful about how we deal with this. We don't want to open up and allow everybody to send you mails, and we don't want to block you from, uh, from receiving any mails from anybody. And uh, the gray listing technique of telling them to try again later is very, very powerful, but it's only powerful when you can still use this. Um, so the trap list is uh, one of the two lists that we're, di we're, um, we're distributing. Uh, it's also commonly known as a blacklist. That makes it easier to, to picture it in your mind. Uh, it's generated from the source server's spamd trap list, which is essentially uh, each server has a list of IP addresses that are known bad and you should never have any uh, activity on them. And so, for example, Peter Hanstein has a list of these address or a list of these uh, email addresses on his website. That is a if you email anybody on this list, you're clearly a spammer and you deserve to be blocked. And uh, um, when you send an email to a server with that's using this trap list, you uh, the IP address gets added to the list and distributed for 24 hours. And every time they, send, they have a new attempt to connect and send, 
it, uh, the timer resets. So it's, they can stay on for quite some time. Uh, the bypass list, also commonly known as a whitelist, is, uh, so SpamD itself has a fairly low bar to be added to the whitelist. Um, under the default configuration, if they try again within uh, four hours, um, then they will be added to the whitelist, and they stay on the whitelist for about 36 days. And that's enough time for the monthly mailman password reminders or other very low traffic things to not be delayed. Um, we want to distribute a list that's slightly more difficult to get on. Because if we just simply do that, then if, they, if one spammer gets through the list, or gets through to any of the upstream peers, then he can get access to all of them. Um, so currently what it's set for is that it has to be in the white list for 75 days, and they have to have sent more than 10 emails during that time. And then we think it's a, we think it's a real server. So um, why is this a useful thing to do? Large organizations have more emails uh, this way, you, and you can, you can use their, um, the information that they've generated to help protect your network, um, either from people who are knowingly spamming them, they're spamming large organizations, they're likely also to try and spam you at some point. Uh, same thing with the semi-trusted servers. If they're reasonably, uh, reasonably uh, good enough to get through their lists, then they're probably also reasonably good for you as well. Um, the other thing is that the shared bypass list helps the, the commonly known as the Gmail sender problem. Um, so larger organizations that send a lot of emails, for example, Gmail, they will do a retry from different IPs within their network. Most don't. Most don't. Gmail is the main one that does, correct. Um, that's why it's the Gmail problem, not the Yahoo problem. Um, and this way, uh, a large organization would get enough email traffic from Gmail or whoever else is behaving like this, and this way you can gain the benefit of, of that list without having to go through and whitelist all of Gmail or whitelist all of whoever else is doing this sort of thing. Um, so now we get into a bit of uh, what we've learned over the last year of running the service. Um, basically, I have about uh, just a bit over 163 million events in my log file, and that includes um, each addition, each subtraction, um, when uh, my upstream servers connect and disconnect, things like this. Um, so unfortunately, it's only IPv4 entries for now. Um, OpenBSD BGP SpamD does not support IPv6 yet. Uh, that is something for future work that I'll talk about later. Uh, interestingly, none of the IP addresses on my list can be aggregated and into more into a uh, into better than a slash 32 net block which I thought was very surprising. Nobody on the whitelist can be aggregated, nobody on the blacklist could be aggregated. There was just enough spaces on the boundaries where you could not do that. Um, out of this, uh, there was about 17,000 of the slash 24s, which is the, um, for those of you who don't, who don't know uh, CIDR addressing, is the, the first three octets of an IP address. Com also formerly known as a class C. Formerly known. <laughs> Please note that is ancient terminology that I think was deprecated before some of you were even born. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, yeah. Call it what it is. Yeah. Um, so 17,000 uh, slash 24s had at least one IP address listed. And in the bypass list, and then 22,000 uh, are represented in the trap list. Um, there is about almost 1.2 million unique IP addresses listed in this. Uh, 31 entries have been added to uh, the blacklist more than 10,000 times. Uh, about 10,000 ent entries were added more than 1,000 times, and 800,000 were announced only once. They got added to the list, they fell off, never got added again an entire year. Um, 
this is. Yes, uh, I would, ins but instead of saying machines, I would say IP addresses. Because it's entirely possible that the, that the machine itself has been moved around to other IPs. Yeah, sure. But yeah. Another question about that would be if you um, had eaten this service, mm -hmm. then you're not going to send announcements for things that uh, were already blocked in, right? So Correct. So the, the, the 31 entities have 10,000 announcements. How are you getting 10,000 announcements? Uh, because um, this is uh, coming in from the upstream where it updates its metadata. So that upstream may not actually be blocking things on any given network. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The setting us data and utilizing the data from it are two separate events. And so um, some of my upstreams use all of the data I'm providing, some of them do not. Okay, so uh, not really. The way I've designed the network is that the users are not able to, pr to inject any data into this. Uh, I reject all, um, all attempts of, of announcing an IP address from just the users, and I have a list of just five people that are providing data that I know personally, and we have a, uh, Basically, a, just a, a verbal contract about how we add the lists and how and how we handle this, just to make sure we don't, like, we're not adding sites that we have a vendetta against, as an as an example. And we're we're very careful to be only you you have to ex, uh, exhibit this behavior to be added to either the whitelist or the blacklists. Right. It's just if, if one or two of those five started actually blocking, they're they're inbound now based on based on the list, and you just capture it the same way. Um, Depends on how they do this. If they're also using SpamD to uh, to do this, then it would update their counters when the actual traffic comes in, not when the block gets added. Okay. So it, yeah, when when you if you if you both send and receive the data, you still only update yourself based on what traffic you have actually seen. And block sync would mean basically blocking if the list comes in SpamD. Yeah. The, the, the blocking is, is not, is, we don't block it at the TCP layer. They still get connected. Um, that's actually a good point. Um, that is a very critical aspect of this, is that it is dangerous to just simply do a TCP block and just drop the connection. Um, the, most fam the, the famous example is that you are running an email server for your company. Your, um, your CEO is in discussions with another company about like a corporate merger or something huge and very important. And their salespeople have decided to just, or their, their marketing people or whoever, bought a list of, of email addresses that includes one or two of your trap lists. They send an email there, and then the other company CEO sends your CEO some important document that happens to be the first com intentional communication. Now you're on the blacklist, and then uh, if you were just dropping it at the network layer, then you would, the other side wouldn't know why. The CEO asked his, his tech guy, well, where is email? Well, I don't know. Their email server is down. It's not responding. We can't connect to it. And then that could, um, that could possibly put your job in danger. Now, if you're using SpamD and, and you tell it, oh, hey, you're a spammer, then the other side can make the, their own correct decisions about what they're doing and about how to either get off this list or find out what's going on. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So we've also received a lot of interesting IP addresses listed. Um, this is so the way the addresses get in is that this is the network traffic after the three-way handshake, after the after an attempted SMTP transaction. So these systems have routes to it. And as you can see, all of these networks that I'm listing are not supposed to be routable on the public internet. 
So for example, I have three entries from the 0 slash 8 network, which is always defined as this network. Um, I have some reserved entry. I have 17 in the reserved parts. I have even uh, 255, 255, 255, 255 listed in this one. Um, there's been a total of uh, about 98,000 uh, additions to the list from networks in the, or from uh, IP addresses in these ranges. I find it amusing. <laughs> uh, it's 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 not faith. It's not necessarily faith in, in the BGP filters that other people are running. Is that these should not exist on the network, and so, okay, let's just count them. I didn't check, but I can I can check later. We can check offline. Yeah, like I, I will I will talk to my upstreams about this data. I found it yesterday evening. So I will talk to my upstreams about who these are and if they're infected by it or whatever. Do yep. entries that other people have established that they are getting spam from this IP address? Correct. Exactly. Somebody <laughs> gets spam from a multicast IP address. Somebody decides to route it. Somebody, Somebody decided to announce it, and it showed up on their router magically. Yeah, so like the, the RFC 1918s, I'm not so worried about those. The, the, um, but like the link local and the, the multicast and the reserved addresses, those are interesting. Um, so the number of entries, those, those are how many unique IP addresses per each of them. Oh, sure, you can announce whatever the hell you feel like. That's fine, yeah. Yes. No, because the... So there's, there's a there, so I I I can say that one two seven zero zero one is one of the addresses. I don't remember the other yeah, one. Yeah, and, and I yeah. mean like RFC nineteen eighteen stuff internally that might be routed internally hitting the machine shouldn't happen, but I could see it happening. Yeah. But some of the rest of it, it's like yeah, the old zero is excluded. Don't don't believe that anybody yeah. is is doing the proper filter. And so and so um, you would you would have comment during this other discussion that um, what if it was somebody relaying? It's we only look at the TCP. Uh, the, basically, the IP header of the uh, connecting system. Right. Yeah. It could still be, I mean, you'd have proxy or something. That's what you could do. It would have to be like it have to be like a layer four redirect or something like this, in order for, in order for that to work. If it was a layer seven proxy, then it could, then that would not work. <laughs> okay. Quite quite possibly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting set. Uh, so these are the top 10 entries in my blacklists. Um, we see here that we have a nice, nice, uh, uh, nice individual from Bulgaria with almost 14,000 entries in the list. Uh, he has uh, been added and received and dropped all this. Um, we go through, we just have all sorts of just interesting, interesting IP addresses. Um, they're naughty people. I think I'm going to go email their abuse. Uh, handles and see and see how see if they respond or or care. I'm just seeing the list of not spamming the voice over the page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I I still get a fair amount of spam from Italy. This is one IP address, and the. Uh, Anybody own any of those networks? <laughs> I know I know some of those. Tell us on Italian about IP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, to be fair, some of this may be very old data, and they and they may just at the beginning of the year, and they may not still be in the list. I did not check that, um, but I thought I thought a top ten would be be fun to look at. What the heck is Argon Dutch? I'm trying to remember the unique because one of the big fuckers. It's not me. No, you're a medium fucker. <laughs> the impressive part is somebody, some, well, I guess it may be an SMTP server. The impressive part is somebody in, 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 in Deutschland managed to keep an IP address for long enough. <laughs> <laughs> So don't necessarily trust the um, the reverse DNS entry. Uh, for example, the bginfo.net was somebody completely wrong. It was just a .com, and I was like, okay, well, who is this? Domain does not exist. Ah, okay. He's running it right now. Who's the real problem here? Is that still so? We have 4,600 uh, single ASs, and I'm running the one for the for the mobile. Yeah. One second. Okay. Um, yeah. So for the recording, 4,800. 4,600. Or oh, I'm sorry, 4,600 unique, unique ASs, ASs. Yeah. and hopefully by the end, if I talk slowly enough then we may have the, the top 10. <laughs> Run faster, hamsters. Um, so we've learned a lot of information from this. Uh, so the good parts we learned is that many sources are sending information, and this is providing a much bigger list than you would ordinarily get. Um, the, the block lists are actually fantastic uh, to share among, to, amongst the groups. And that getting, uh, having this information uh, from many sources, spreading it out mm -hmm. to many clients, is uh, making email a lot better for each of the individual users of the system. Um, additionally, I've even gotten some uh, some third-party people who are making this work on non-OpenBSD. Uh, my original uh, my original creation was just focusing on the OpenBSD side of this. And other people are using it. For example, uh, Mark Martinik is—he uh, was able to make it work using FreeBSD, uh, RBL, DNS, uh, DNSD, and Spam Assassin. And he sent a basically a how-to and a short Perl script of how to extract all the information to the Spam Assassin mailing lists. Um, I also had someone uh, talk with me privately about um, they're using Quagga to extract the information and adding it to their own um, their own uh, proprietary infrastructure at their place of work. So thank you very much to, tho to those two people. Um, if other people want to make this work with their own systems, uh, that'd be fantastic. Uh, please feel free to ask me details and I can help you um, figure out what you need to extract and how to add it to your systems. Um, also, it is very fast to update all the clients. Uh, the traditional problems of uh, downloading a list off of the internet means that you have to run, you have to update it periodically, and the source files may not be created instantaneously. And um, the traditional problem is that if the source is updated once an hour, and you download it at the top of the hour, and then a uh, spam IP address gets added at one after the hour, then you have to wait 59 minutes before it shows up in your lists. The other problem is when everyone else is updating their lists at the top of the hour, then the server hosting this data file just freaks out and just kind of melts for a little bit. <laughs> and that, that's a huge amount of load on the, the, on the source server for this. Um, so 
I did a test during one of the talks earlier, and it took me only seven seconds to download the full lists over BGP using the conference wireless. So uh, that was nice. Um, it takes under two seconds to propagate the changes to all the members when one of my upstream sources decides to add it. It's probably sub half a second, but I just have not spent the time measuring it that closely. Uh, we can make this even faster. Um, right now, one of the main um, one of the main limitations for adding the data is that the servers themselves need to run excuse me cron jobs. And there is a few ideas that I have for how to um, have the have both SpamD and BGP talk closer to each other. So the bad. Uh, first we had the good, now we have the bad. Um, unfortunately, the bypass list has too many spammers on it. They have spent enough time in the whitelists and they sent enough mails to propagate through. Um, I received uh, a couple mentions from users that they've simply had to stop using it because too much was getting through the lists. So we need to spend more time adjusting heuristics. Uh, maybe it's that we need to move up the number of emails they have to send. Maybe it's we have to change the number of days. It's we just need to experiment and find out what a op more optimal number would be. Uh, more bad was there was a server crash. It uh, caused about a five-day outage. Um, basically, the power supply blew up at the hosting provider I was using for this. Um, this happened while I was on vacation in New Zealand, which has some of the most interesting internet in the world. Um, slightly better than Canada, but slightly less places to actually be able to connect to. <laughs> um, it also happened during a long holiday weekend in California where the hosting provider is. So uh, that's why it took so long to get this back up and working. Uh, the ugly parts of this. Um, I have not been as responsive as I could have been. Um, I have basically had life interfere uh, change jobs, very, very busy with all of that. Um, I have not been able to dedicate the time I really should have been able to dedicate to writing more, writing more code for this to improve the, the usability, um, trying to get more upstream sources for this, and trying to uh, improve documentation for the clients and trying to get alternate OSs and alternate methods working for people. Um, as I said when I first announced it, that IPv6 support is coming soon. We still don't have it, unfortunately. Um, the bright side is that the BGP mechanism works perfectly fine with adding IPv6 addresses to the list. Uh, when we get this, clients will just need to spend about two minutes updating some of their filters, and then it'll just magically work again. Um, the, uh, for the, the servers, or for the, the SPAMD sources, we just need to add IPv6 support to SPAMD, which there's been some brief examinations of this and it looks like it'll take quite a bit of work, unfortunately. So, lessons learned. Um, overall, I would say this would be a success. When I started it, I did not know what to expect from this project. I didn't know what sort of um, how useful it would be for people. Um, generally very positive from all my users, of the, especially with the, the block list. Um, for future work, we definitely need to fix the heuristics for the bypass list, the white, the white list. Um, like I see from Bob, he's nodding his head on just upping the limit of how many emails is probably a first thing to try. Yes, yeah, we need to. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, we definitely need to add uh, IPv6 support to SPAMD so that way we can start collecting this. Um, I, in the, about the last year, I've been receiving actual spam to my, uh, on my server from infected machines that have native v6. So this is starting to slowly become a real issue, and with the uh, the mass push you of see this here in Mac, which I <laughs> it's growing it's up, it's real.
You just have to, you have to explain it colorfully. <laughs> for entertainment purposes only. Um, yeah, so so IPv6 is slowly becoming a real issue, and with the, the big push along uh, on the whole internet, especially with some of the larger ISPs pushing out and trying to get as much native v6 uh, for their customers as possible, this problem is only going to grow. So it's better to address it sooner rather than later and avoid the whole, uh, the same problem that IPv4 emails had way back when people started developing the serious anti-spam techniques. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I have a question about the Okay. We'll do that. Don't answer that question. What? A lot. A lot. We'll just work on the Balmer peak. Uh, so the other thing that we need to work on is getting 36 hours days so that there is actually enough time to do the paid work that allows us to have, to have time to work on things that are fun and, and interesting. Um, if you know somebody that can actually pay for fun and interesting, please let me know. Um, so one of the things that we need is uh, additionally is yeah easier processing of spamd on the on the source systems feeding me the data. Uh, right now we have some Perl scripts that go through the data every uh, depends on the server on the server by at least every ten minutes or every twenty minutes or so that processes it and feeds it in. Um, there are ways of of having the two talk to each other, so. This can be speeded up into a more real-time set. Once we know that this uh, IP address has this behavior, then it just gets added. Um, there are different ways of, of deciding how we're getting things on the whitelist. Um, we can decide on, how, on who we're receiving mail from or who we're sending mail to. And is there a way to extract that data from the database so we can feed it into uh, SpamD? Um, that would be one way, also, of lowering the false positive rate, because it's everyone that you're sending mails to. And, and those IP addresses would, would also be interesting to, to share around. Um, they're included in the whitelist, but they're mixed together. And, and one of my thoughts is that, can we differentiate between how it was added? Because I think the ones that we're sending mails to have a different value than the ones that we're receiving mail from for different very versions of value. Um, the other thing is finding more sources from different to new countries. So as an example, university students in Canada are not going to be sending a lot of emails to Japan. And uh, we have the different region problems of like, for example, uh, also like a, a larger um, a German free mail site We'll send a lot of email within Germany, but not necessarily to, you know, to France, for example. So we want to get more uh, more countries with their specific. <laughs> um, so that we, we we get to the the data of which countries are using which services. Um, another thing we would like to do is get more, get a, at least a second route server. Um, currently, the one that we're running is in San Jose, California, and uh, for us, uh, for us in Europe, um, it's quite a bit of a distance to go, especially when um, it's it's just a, it's just a distance to go. And it's kind of a, a hassle to connect that far. Um, the other thing is that uh, BGP was originally designed for point-to-point -point links where you have uh, very fast connectivity and uh, very low latency to it. And the way this is set up is that it's going over multiple hops. It's up to 64, um, uh, over 64 peers. And this uh, can probably be improved a lot. Um, I see a lot of frequent connects, disconnects, immediate re reconnects from various client machines. Very little. It's tiny. Uh, 
Uh, right now, it's uh, five upstream services and 28 clients. Yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's that's the the concept is to have um, some more route reflectors and some just some more, just so it's distributed around, and that if one system needs to go down for whatever reason, then we're not going to lose the full feed for everybody. Um, some future work, just some interesting ideas of uh, what may or may not work. Um, one suggestion um, I keep getting, and one of my original ideas was. I, w I only want to add something to my block list or to my white list if both, if two servers tell me that it's on, the, on one of their lists. Um, currently, that's somewhat difficult. Uh, BGP does not support that sort of thing. What it, BGP does is it makes the, it chooses the best route um, and then sends that data. It does not combine the data. So that's not sure if that can be done with this system. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is, is, would be nice for brainstorming is uh, much deeper integration between BGP and SpamD. Um, some things that would be nice to do would be like maybe do only a partial sync of the database uh, instead of having to send all of the data at once, only do a partial. Um, that would make it much easier because then we could just start feeding the data directly from BGPD. Um, maybe have spam to use the PF table for everything instead of just whitelists. That's I read, interesting. I, it, I wanted to use the integrated PF table for all things. So unfortunately, I have to have a little bit more data in order to run the PF table, which means I have to go look at um, Cedric's book. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so this is uh, some thoughts, and there's some definitely some upsides and downsides to to all of these things. Um, definitely be working with and heckling Bob about this. Uh, so I definitely want to thank um, when I uh, created the system, I ended up writing a, uh, a short white paper about this, and uh, definitely thank Bob for for assisting me with this. Um, uh, I have my upstreams with the University of Alberta. Uh, Bob Beck's personal site, Obtuse. Um, also have Henning Brower of uh, the ISP BSVS in Germany. And Peter Hanstein, who runs um, also his very nice track list at uh, BSD, uh, yeah, bsdlee.net. Um, also definitely want to, to thank uh, sonic.net, who is uh, the hosting provider that I'm using for this service. Um, they hate spam, and they're willing to piss, them, piss off spammers uh, uh, as, as part of this mechanism. So, uh, any questions? You know, one of the issues with BGP in the last bunch of years, obviously more with Cisco than, than with you know, the GPU version, is the size of the table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're pushing the size of the table way beyond, you know, say 400,000 routes or whatever it has. In the um, So okay, so two res really two responses to that. Um, the largest I've seen the I've, the largest feed that I, I have sent out was two hundred fifty thousand routes, and which is currently smaller than the full feed, which is above half a million. 
Um, second off, here's a nickel, buy some RAM. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it, this, this is, yeah. Yeah, the, the Yes. <laughs> um, this is something that we're watching. Um, I but this becomes one of those thousands of skills. Yeah. So there's room to grow. So so currently I have not seen it show up in uh, above 0.1% of CPU usage. Uh, the RAM usage is incredibly tiny as well. Um, I am not worried for the foreseeable future unless it suddenly every email server on the planet starts using this. Right. Your, well, and your 20,000 entries and mm -hmm. 25 customers. Yeah. Right. How, much, how, much RAM, how much RAM do you need for the cloud version? Like 100 megabytes? No, I think it's like 35 megs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it's only a 32-bit system. On a 64-bit, it needs twice as much, clearly. Yeah, Joe, you're going you're gonna to run yeah. into this capability issues here because yeah. you have to establish clients. Yeah. 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 You guys are both being very Yes, e exactly. To provide yeah. more endpoints for those clients yeah. to hit yeah. so that you, you can scale. So yeah, the, the original intention of, of, of this project was just to be an experiment. I had no idea if this was going to succeed or be useful or anyone would care. And now, after one year, it appears that this is good. It definitely needs some more work, clearly, and definitely needs, we need to look at, yeah, the scalability issues and how large can the route tables go and, all, and how many clients can be connected, of course. Mm -hmm. on this is yep. we've considered very similar things, you know, advertising with certain information via VPC mm -hmm. or, if you will, the community around the project that I'm involved with. Okay. And since there's, you know, something close between like 49 and half a million of them right now, mm -hmm. we're already having to deal with that sort of downstream consumer side. Yeah. Using open VPC not for spam, but for traffic. Yep. So I, I can mention that um, there's a group of OpenBSD developers who are selling a, uh, a, a appliance based on OpenBSD for high-end routers and, and uh, high-end routers and firewalls. And one of the things they do is they have uh, some very nice hardware testing devices that are doing BGP um, and just just torture testing BGP, putting in like 10 million routes and doing you know several thousand peers and things like this. And they and this group is keeping a close eye on on those side, those types of scalability issues because it, it benefits their company. Um, they're also feeding all of this data back into the OpenBSD developer community. So um, as a group, we can all make this better for not just their company but for all the other people who are using it. And this also you know means they have fewer patches. So it it is it is something that the overall group is paying uh, a lot of a lot of attention to. 
definitely. But yeah, we def definitely need to to look at the, uh, the thousands and millions of of clients. See how much has see uh, how many use that. Um, but also, I think the the target of this this project is not is not home users, but it's email server administrators. And so the, the upper limit of how many people will be utilizing the service will not be as big as just home users. So I think like, as some of the scalability issues will be solved simply because of the, the target audience, I think. Yeah, and I've had a, a, a growth of up to 28 people over a year. So I, if I'm at the same rate, I should be relatively safe for a while. Yeah, that's what I mean. That yep. scale it out, really yep. your issue will be the number of clients. Yeah. Uh, get a nice way for somebody to say, hey, I want to run another question. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Nice. yeah, and that is that is something I want to do, just so that way I can also just balance out the, the traffic. No, we, Yes, yeah, exactly. And yeah. This is part of the <coughs> yeah. And part of that may be just Possibly, we'll see. Yeah. So interesting. One thing that I would like to see, maybe I'm dreaming from out of the sky, is the, the ability to support multiple or all of these tiers of information. So at the top, it's like, if I, do I want to send additional? Do I want to do advanced SASing, or do I just this and not to get broad array and say, yes, we can do that. Yes, some of them really do both. Yes, so, and that's exact. That is precisely how I'm distributing this, is that each IP address has a community, either, um, either colon 42 if, if it's good, or colon 666 if it's bad. And we can um, change, yeah, you know. Our, our, we can go between the two and we, we can decide at what we want. Um, those were, numbers were just arbitrarily chosen. They may or may not have meaning. Um, yeah, so it's, the system already easily supports this. It's just how do we define what they are and then how do we get them listed? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the way the community is set up is that each of my upstream peers have a unique AS, and it is um, AS, then the, the separator, and if it's good or bad. And then I also add my own for the route server itself, so that way you can say, I want everything from the service trust, or you can select based on who you're getting the information from. Yeah. Right. In the first uh, name where you're done, you have with uh, AS32 being on your The first source service that I'm using with AS32. Um, I've already tested the client side with 32-bit with ASs, yeah, and it's trivial. Yeah, that's not that's an issue. Yeah. Like Josh, people just have in the back of the email system. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we're also not using real ASs. Yeah, right. Henning is using a real AS, but everyone else involved with uh, the project is. So if the. Yeah. That's a long way to go, and I think that would be a good problem. Well, actually, I don't know if that would be a good problem to have, because I don't know if I can trust that many people. Um, so currently, well, it's. How could you go for X number of communities in your experience? Um, mm -hmm. so for numbers. For numbers. Yeah. I don't work with those numbers, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's the new, there's the new uh, we're working on a new uh, RFC bus that sends communities, so that's the new 16 bit. Well, so, so since everyone was just using 16-bit communities, 
Uh, I decided to use this just to be a very easy way to say, this is the peer, this is, this is identif an identifiable way of seeing who, uh, who added this data to the list. Um, I agree that this, this will be a problem in the future. Hopefully by then the RFC and the code will be written so we can then uh, edit. <laughs> No, but he's going to write it anyways. <laughs> uh, so that's a good one. I'll add that to my list. Um, I think the other challenge is, you know, good, good source of data. Yes, exactly. The problem with the U of A source is that the source is really weak. Yeah. But then you lost, by the time you have a problem, the 20 year olds install probably works and they don't use it enough. So. Yeah, it's entirely possible, yes. Um, Maybe scalability will solve because everyone just uses Facebook uh, for communications instead. Um, <laughs> or Twitter or... Or, or pick, pick, your, pick your favorite social media network that's not email. Yeah. <laughs> you may be able to. Um, I don't see why not. Actually, no. Uh, Twitter has a, uh, an API limit of how many posts you're allowed to make uh, per a variety of different time frames. <laughs> uh, there, there is Identica, which is open source and roughly based around the Twitter concept. So maybe that could be that could be utilized. IRC. IRC. Nope, not enough XML. We need Jabber. Because <laughs> then it can all just be all just be um, you know arguments. Yeah. Yep, that's what we need: federation. RFC one one four nine. Yep. Look it up. Well, we we've already had a, a what what actually one of my upstreams implemented RFC one one four nine as well. <laughs> yes. Maybe in carrier transportation. Yeah. Well, no, the one forty nine is very much a complaint protocol. It's just complaints. You teach them to shit on every site they have. Uh, kind of on topic, yeah. Um, so other, other than uh, pigeons, do we have any more questions? Uh, it is in conjunction with SpamD. So basically, this is a method of just distributing the IP addresses. Um, the way that I have, the instructions that I provide tell you how to utilize this with PF and with, with SpamD. Um, the bypass list you add to a special uh, PF table, excuse me, so that way they, they appear as if they were just on your regular whitelist from SpamD, and, that, um, and then this adds it to a small blacklist that gets updated in, in, BG, in SpamD. So then when somebody tries to connect to you, if they've never connected to you before, then they get sent to this blacklist. If they're already on your whitelist, they go through as they ordinarily would. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's basically, it's, um, you just add uh, two scripts to the machine. Um, you, yes, you can add this data to any other service that you would want. Um, uh, my user that was using it on Spam Assassin, he was adding it as just a, uh, an RBL lookup service. So it gave negative points if it was on the blacklist and a small amount of positive points if it was on the whitelist. And that way the scoring would still work correctly. And you can use it for any sort of data you want like that. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>